didn't have, yeah. you know, before the farm bill. And, you know, hopefully we can get back to 1937 and pay our taxes. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, we are live. Welcome back, everybody. This morning, this is the Utah CBD Collective. My name is John Comas Jr. Joining us today, of course, are our lovely hosts and founders, Ryan Fritchie and Mandy Kerr. Awesome. Hello. And uh, um, also joining us today, and we're really excited about this because this is something that Mandy showed us a little bit about a little bit yesterday on the show. And uh, we're excited to bring on Chris Morewood, everybody. Chris Morewood is <laughs> in the house. And uh, she's an author, and she talks a lot about you know kids and cannabis, and and just a lot of other various subjects. But before we get started, um, there aren't any other announcements, not anything that we want to talk about on the CBD Collective side. But we want to kind of throw the ball over to you, Chris, and just let you brag about yourself for a second. If you could take like three minutes or so, please take a few minutes and share with our listeners just who you are. Brag about yourself. The platform is yours. This is your podium. Please take the microphone and it is all yours. Please tell us why you're awesome. <laughs> well, some people would beg to differ, but <laughs> I, um, my background is actually about uh, 30 years in nonprofit management. So um, my career, I started out in disease specific nonprofits as far as being an executive director, development director. And I um, had transferred into the cannabis space in about 2013. And I went in um, on a publication called the Marijuana News. And um, that was when cannabis was just starting out. So we figured it would be great to be on a digital platform but back then. I am not a technological person at all. So um, the, the way that the industry has changed um, since legalization, since Colorado was the first state to legalize, I've had the opportunity to look at this from a really broad perspective. Um, I have also, right after um, I decided that the marijuana news was, we didn't have enough content at that time. And as you can imagine now, we have abundance of content out there. But I moved into standards development. So I worked in standards for FOCUS, which is the foundation of unified standards, and worked for them for two years as their development director. And FOCUS has a for-profit arm and a non-profit arm. And FOCUS is concentrating on every other industry in the world, shopping carts and tables and tires for your car, clothing, everything has a standard. And cannabis, which is can be either marijuana or can be hemp, um, is the exclusion to that. And even after the Foreign Bill passed, we still don't have a set of international standards, which means all of the things that we're going to talk about today, whether it's the THC content in the plant, whether it's talking to your children about this plant, whether it's about banking, anything, any topics. Um, I, I have a little bit of knowledge in a lot of subjects. And so I'm happy to answer questions on both the, the hemp and the actual cannabis marijuana side. So, um, so that's my background. I currently own a consumption friendly space in Colorado which means people that are coming to events can consume legally at uh, this event center. It's called the Ozone. I also do a lot of consulting. Um, I have been producing events for a long time. And so I do a lot of, uh, I used to work in sports marketing. Um, and this is a very unusual industry. It's getting better, um, especially on the, the hemp side. Um, but this is an industry like no other that you cannot advertise your products. So talk about a total, you know, 360 from the way you can normally do business. Everything about these industry partners with working with people that have been in business, that have been in the nonprofit world. Everybody is jumping in from different aspects. And while I've exclusively worked in the marijuana cannabis space for the last four years. About two years ago, I made the jump um, to learn as much as I possibly could about hemp. And hemp is 
interesting because I believe that hemp is going to be 20 times the size of the legal marijuana market. And I'd first and foremost like to say, which this is clears up any confusion. Uh, today, I'm going to refer to what we're talking about, hemp, as hemp. I'm going to refer to marijuana, cannabis, marijuana, because they're both the same plant. It's the cannabis sativa plant. The only difference is the amount of THC. And right now, it is 0.03% for THC levels in industrial or agricultural hemp. I also feel that like we've changed the vernacular with uh, marijuana because marijuana has very deep racist roots as far as the, um, I guess the demonization of the plant. Um, so I would like to say cannabis when I'm talking about marijuana and I'm gonna say hemp when I'm talking about hemp. And then I also feel that changing the word from, from marijuana to cannabis, the hemp industry needs to do the same thing. Right now, people refer to it as industrial hemp because that's what, what is written in the farm bill. And when I'm thinking about hemp, I'm thinking about food that I'm eating. I'm thinking about clothes that I'm wearing. I'm thinking about um, beauty products. And so I don't want to put anything that says industrial in my body or on it. So I think the first thing that people should think about is the way that we speak about this plant. Uh, it, because it is, it is not all industrial. There are many, many, many industrial uses, but the main thing is, is that is such a versatile plant that we have to speak about it in terms that people can understand. So just like you can say medical or recreational or adult use cannabis, you can say industrial or agricultural hemp. Because for me, then that way I understand that industrial would pertain to biodiesel, to hempcrete, to insulation, to flooring, to ropes and sales. And then the agricultural hemp would be something that you would produce the CBD oil or that you would produce, you know, the hemp seeds that you put in your salads or I'm sorry, what? Consumables. Consumable, but also beauty products, something yes. that, you know, things that that you're not going to want the word industrial attached to those products. So, right. again, we have marketing challenges. And so I think that any any product that you're going to do through this beautiful plant, you're going to have to make sure that people are understanding that there are many, many uses. 250,000 things that you can do with it. And so so then that way, when you know what I'm talking about, cannabis, I'll be talking about marijuana mm -hmm. and hemp, I'll either say industrial or agricultural. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, and I do have the books that we were talking about, Mandy. And so this was the first book that we came out with in um, 2014. It's called Cali Cannabis, Jack's About Cannabis. And so, um, we have talked about in that book, basically, um, you know, where you should keep your cannabis and how you can use that as a medical product that could help you with, you know, a variety of illnesses and also about the legal, the laws, but it's in a very easy to read format and it can be for your a grandmother who has glaucoma. It could be for your nosy neighbor who wants to know what you're growing in your greenhouse. Um, it could be to your your children. It could be to your doctor. We we talk about this plant, um, and we think that the education should start at the very basic, which would be children. The next generation of leaders in this country need to know about this plant. And so then after, um, right before the farm bill passed in 2017, we came out with this book, which is Hana Hemp, and it is the history, the healing history of hemp. So one else you see that? Mm -hmm. Better light. So- Chris. Yes. Real quick, um, how can somebody get those books? 
you can go to our website, um, which is CallieAndFriends.com. We're available on Amazon. We're available um, on Kindle. We also will ship the books. We are currently out of stock on Cali because Cali, um, we have been waiting and waiting and waiting to print both of these books on hemp paper. And cool. Mandy and I have had long conversations about it. Um, we also have both of the books. They're translated into Spanish, French, and Chinese. Nice. And so you could get digital versions. We do have um, copies that we are shipping out upon a hemp. And, um, and then hopefully, I have made some connections in the hemp paper world um, about uh, printing both of the books on hemp. And so it has up to this point been cost prohibitive. And also, whereas we used to print everything in this country on hemp paper, um, the presses right now, they're digital presses. So it's difficult for them to print on hemp paper. Um, a lot of them have just switched over to digital. So you have to find a printer too that will printed on hemp paper and I'm even been looking for hemp ink. So I envision a world in the future where we have books that are about hemp printed on hemp paper with hemp ink. So mm. very nice. Well, okay. and it's hard to fathom for people um, that that was a norm, <laughs> but that's it. Right, Chris? I mean, absolutely. It was, it was, it was meant to be, as far as when the colonization of America took place, they sent over, the King of England sent over seeds on those ships and all of the colonies that were required to, to plant hemp. Um, hemp was such a valuable product and it was used for everything, for animal bedding, for buildings, for clothing, the ropes on the ships and the sails on the ships and the bedding and the food. And so it was such a useful plant. Um, it was required for people to plant hemp. Same thing with the World War I and World War II, hemp for victory. Um, with the Constitution, the first draft of the Constitution of the United States was written on hemp paper. The um, all of most documents, most old documents um, that are sitting in the Smithsonian are the majority is hemp fiber. And so when you look at the history of this country, it was founded on hemp. Hemp has been an integral part of our society since the founding of America. And, you know, that's why it's so interesting that we had the technology to print on hemp paper with hemp ink. We had the technology to pay our taxes in hemp. We had the technology to, in the monetization system at that time, to pay our taxes with hemp. But we also had the ability to utilize hemp in every aspect of our lives. And we had decortication machines that could handle hemp. We had processing, uh, not standards, but they redded their hemp in the fields. They you know, had machines that could handle things that we are hard pressed to find those machines today, unless we go over to Europe or, you know, to, to Asia and, you know, the, the cost is exorbitant. So, you know, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson grew hemp on their plantations. This is a part of our society that while the government would have liked to think, make us forget about it, we need to think in a bigger picture that a lot of those technologies, the patents that existed for, um, for these machines, uh, recipes for using hemp in your cooking, um, all of the things that, that we can talk about, all the uses of it, have been utilized up until 1941, basically. So the Tax Act went into effect in 1937, and that was called the Marijuana Tax Act. And the Marijuana Tax Act was brought on by, go figure, large corporate entities. At that time, William Randolph Hearst owned most of the timber mills and most of the printing in this country. So they were able to um, print a lot of, I guess what you would call fake news, <laughs> which is yellow journalism, which is the 
uh, media companies were owned by someone who had an interest in the timber mills. Also, the Rockefellers were very big into oil at that time. Um, as we all know, hemp is an incredible biodiesel. Um, Henry Ford built his first car out of hemp panels, which could run on hemp biodiesel. And so think about where the automobile industry would be today if the Rockefellers had not said, well, look, we own all this oil and gas. We would like to keep it that way. Um, and again, William Randolph Hearst, a, a tree takes 30 years to grow. A hemp plant takes, you know, 90 days. So we, we've got to understand where the, the corporate interests are coming in at this that time. And they were able to bend people's reality. People that grew up, you know, farming with hemp and suddenly this plant that you can pay your taxes in and is in every aspect of your life is now illegal. And so we're kind of at that point again where we have the ability to utilize this plant for everything. And, um, but we have to be incredibly careful because we are fighting some very powerful entities. Um, right now we have, um, you know, Monsanto, which has great interests in the agricultural roots of this country as far as the farmers are concerned. And what a lot of people don't understand is hemp remediates the soil. Cannabis pulls all of the toxins out of the soil, whether it is pesticides, whether it is herbicides, whether it is um, heavy metals, whether it is anything. It pulls all those toxins out of the soil. So while we're going around this country and telling farmers plant hemp, plant hemp, plant hemp, well, not only do we have to consider the, the supply chain, but we also have to consider if that, that crop is going to be clean. If you're using it for industrial hemp products, such as building materials and you know fabrics and textiles, that's okay to use hemp that has remediated the soil from say a crop that has been cotton, wheat, soybeans, the basic crops that we grow in this country, corn, first of all, they're, they're GMO crops, genetically modified. Then they also are sprayed with specific chemicals that work with that genetic modification. And so the first three crops that you plant, you will not be able to use that CBD oil, the, the cannabis oil, for products that you should ingest or put on your skin because you're still getting all of the remediated product out of the soil in those products. So we have to be very careful about talking to farmers and telling them, you know, go plant hemp and then you can sell it for tons of money in the CBD market. And so that leads mm -hmm. me to the fact that once again, um, big ag is not going to be very happy about it because big ag and big pharma support each other. So again, if you're looking at the oil and gas industry, hemp is an excellent source for fiber for plastics. So anything that is made and manufactured out of plastic can be made out of hemp. Um, as far as pharmaceuticals are concerned, anything that is medicinal that, um, Big Pharma is making into pills. So we are trying to make a product that has been ingested and used in our bodies and on our on our, our clothes and what we write on. We also have to look at the medicinal aspects of the cannabis plant. And part of that is, is that cannabis was listed in the US pharmacopoeia for 200 years. So Cannabis was used before the DEA existed. <laughs> and so it's kind of strange to think that now we're going back to, okay, here's the FDA, the DEA, all of these organizations that are number one, supported very heavily by the commercial aspects of pharmaceuticals. 
So you can advertise pharmaceutical products in this country. I mean, we turn on the television and, you know, you, you watch 15 commercials about pharmaceuticals, but you don't see any commercials about, or very few, I would like to say, very few on mainstream media about cannabis, about the cannabis plant, whether it's hemp, whether it's cannabis, you don't see commercials. So we're getting to a point where we really have to ask for the same benefits that are being offered these other industries, whether it's marketing, whether it is um, the ability to study this plant. So because of the Tax Act of 1937, they labeled both cannabis and hemp Schedule One substances. Now, now we are here 80 years later, and everyone would be very hard pressed, including law enforcement, including a lot of people that work in this industry, including myself. So if I looked at a cannabis plant, I would not be able to tell you visually if it was marijuana cannabis or if it was something that you were going to build a house with. And so we're still going to have transportation issues. We're going to still have pushback from many, many industries, including oil and gas, including, you know, pharmaceutical, including the tobacco industry, including the different products that are going to be pushing up against this, the plastics industry. And so, so it's all interconnected. And what we need to do is be really careful about how we discuss this. And we have to do it with a lot of, I guess, thought behind it and not just lobbyists because lobbyists will push for certain interests. But when you're talking about health and wellness, those are things that go hand in hand with this plant. This plant is so magical and we need to teach future generations that this is a plant that can save the world. It can create the, the CO2. It is um, able to reduce CO2 emissions. It is able to remediate the soil. It is able to be a nutritious product. We could solve world hunger. We could build homes for people that are homeless. We could clothe people and but we need to ramp up that supply chain. We need to get it so it's at an affordable price. We need to get it so we are not sourcing our seed from China or Canada. We need to be able to save those seeds and replant those seeds. And we need to be able to talk to future generations and take the stigma away from this plant. So all of those things I believe are in the future of organizations like yourself. Um, I grew up Mormon, so I have been to the temple in Utah. Um, I am very um, thankful that I had to grow the, the experiences growing up that I did. And I also understand that the Mormon population that's in Utah has very concrete ideas about what this plant is. And so not only are you going to have to face the social stigma of what's happening in the world because people don't know the difference between marijuana and hemp, but you're also going to have to take the population in Utah and re-educate them that this was a plant that their forefathers brought over in the wagons that had canvas covering their wagons with hemp, with probably hemp oil in their lanterns, wearing hemp clothing, writing in hemp paper. So if you can even actually engage with the church and engage with the legislature and engage with people who really are the people who need to, the people that are making the rules for us need to understand the difference between cannabis and hemp. And we also need to understand the difference between the industrial part of it and the agricultural part of it. And so can I show a picture, Mandy, out of the book? Because this is my yeah. Yes, please. And then I've got, after you show that, I do have one quick question for you. Sure, you got. Thoughts. Do you want me, do you want me to? Go ahead and show the picture. Okay. All right. So, so here's how I explain it. So this is a dog. So that's my dog, Thunder. And so he's part of the dog family, which includes wolves, coyotes, and foxes. And then you have the cat family 
That was my that was my cat Wally. But you also have lions and tigers. Sorry, I don't know which way I'm going here. <laughs> <laughs> lions, tigers, cheetahs. Okay, then you have cannabis, the cannabis plant. So this is the cannabis plant. And that's Hana hemp. And so you have cannabis, which can be marijuana, cannabis, can be hemp, cannabis. Also, hackberries and hops are both cannabis plants. So we have to be able to tell the difference between hemp that's grown for industrial use and cannabis that's used for medical or adult use. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Okay, so I have a ton of things I want to talk about. Like, I don't know, I want to give a shout out to, to anybody else that's listening that has questions to drop them in. Um, I've shared this on a couple of different platforms and we'll start a live again later so that we can, um, because you're sharing so much information and so many topics. Um, Ryan or John, do you guys have anything you want to add real quick before I yeah. jump in? For Go ahead, Ryan. And then I've got a I couple of things. So so I just want to take 30 seconds and just ask you one question, but then I would really like to go over to talking about kids as well. Sure. Um, but my question for you, going back a bit on the industrial side and the farming side, is industrial hemp farming, is it something that would be really feasible for a small farmer? Or do you think that is more reserved for the large ag operation. And I ask this because we do have a lot of listeners that are farmers. There's a lot of people in Utah that are looking at getting into farming cannabis or hemp. Um, and so I just wonder, I mean, I know that for the, um, for the CBD side of it, for, um, you know, the, the beauty supply. Yeah, there is a growing population of farmers in that realm. But specifically looking at the, not the ag side of hemp, but the industrial side, can a small farm operation um, actually run a successful business or is pricing just too high? And that's really, we have to wait for the large operations to come in, ones that can really do it at scale. So that's kind of a two-part question. So the first part of that question is, yes, I, th I think that, that everybody should be growing hemp. But you have to look at the fact that this is a wind drift crop. For sure. So we are talking sometimes winds. Yesterday it was windy as all get out here in Colorado. And so if you have a plant that is, you're growing specifically for CBD. Now, and when we're talking about CBD, um, we're talking about one molecule. So there's THC as a molecule. CBD is a molecule. There are 140 other molecules that we need to talk about, but we can talk about that later. But what I'm saying is if you're specifically growing for CBD, which most people are, um, that wind drift, if you're growing outside, can travel 20, 40 miles. So if your neighbor is growing, say, cannabis for consumption that they want the THC to be a little bit higher, um, also, it is a female plant that you're growing for CBD. Mm. So if you have a male and that wind pollen, you can see it. I mean, you can actually see on the plant the pollen. And if that touches the female plants, then you are going to have an entire crop of seeds that, that you know, are hermaphrodite. So you want to make sure that you are discussing this within your county jurisdictions with your neighbors because again if your neighbor drives by and sees a a cannabis plant a uh, entire field they're not going to know the difference then you're going to have wow. the local sheriffs coming in so so again this has got to be a regulated market we have to make sure that we follow the rules we have to make sure that we're not planting it inside the corn crops because we're hiding it because it, it is going to affect your neighbors and your neighbor's crops. The second part of that question is not just the growing. It's called weed for a reason. It's a very easy plant to grow. If you're growing cannabis for medical or recreational adult use, it, if you're growing in a greenhouse 
it's going to take 80 gallons of water to grow that plant to maturity. If you're growing outdoors in the sun with regular irrigation, it's going to take eight gallons of water. That is a huge difference in ratio of how you grow. And in Colorado for marijuana, cannabis, we have to grow indoors mostly because of our laws. And so when you're talking about hemp, especially people are making clones. So those clones are probably going to have to be grown in a um, hermetically sealed environment to make sure that they're all female plants. Because when you go to plant those plants, um, you know, you have to make sure that you have enough help because this is a, um, a very work intensive crop. And right now, because of this virus, we are having a shortage of workers in this country, and we are having a shortage of machinery to process that. Mm -hmm. So I look at it as, think about back in the day, they had cotton gins that were community. They had apple cider presses that, that were community. So until each of those small farming communities have the industrial equipment in order to harvest this, because regular John Deere's are this is a this is a bulky plant, and when you're when you're spacing it out, so if you space it closer together, you're going to get the you know the the tall, skinny, um, and very big herd and bass. The so you're going to have the giant you know stalks that regular machinery can't do. And so then you're going to have to process it. So are you going to red it in the fields and those little teepees that they used to do? Or are you going to take it and put it in a truck and drive it 100 miles with the possibility of getting stopped by local law enforcement, who's then not going to know if it's cannabis or hemp until they test it? And so until those systems are in place with law enforcement, um, then, you know, you're going to have transportation issues. So if there's a way to build a cotton gin or apple press in a decortication or drying plant in each community, then you still have the transportation issues and you still have the processing issues. So it's really not the fact of growing the hemp that's the problem. It grows everywhere in any climate pretty much around the world. So Again, we don't want farmers to be losing money because they their crop goes moldy or because they can't harvest it in time, it gets too hot. And mm -hmm. so those are both incredibly important um, things that you have to consider. So mm -hmm. in Colorado, you know, we can make as many rules and laws as we want, but especially in this time, we do not have the number of agricultural inspectors to go out and to inspect all these crops. So if you planted the way you normally plant, they plant the North 40 and then they plant, you know, different areas. By the time they come out to check that crop, it may have gone hot. And then you're going to have to destroy your entire crop. That's unacceptable. And again, we don't want farmers losing money on this. We want them to be able to grow without having, you know, problems from their neighbors, whether it's legal, whether it's pesticides that are blowing over into their field, whether it's the fact that they can't get it to a processing plant or harvest it quickly enough. So, so those are all points that you have to consider if you're growing this. So I think small farmers could, should grow away, but again, even one plant, one male plant can pollinate an entire field. So yeah. those are just a couple of my thoughts and a couple of no, I, <laughs> Thank you. No, you answered that just perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Mandy, um, go ahead and ask some questions. I mean, I, I would really like to get more into discussing this with kids as well. And I believe you've got some questions around that too. Well, I kind of want to just lead into that. I think everything you're touching on is every reason I'm passionate about this industry is it's amazing to me as I get out in the community and 
I let people know that I'm in the hemp and cannabis industry and immediately they say, oh, you smoke? Mm. Oh, you use CBD? Well, really, my passion is in all of these other opportunities. And I really, I know that that's the history or the uh, opportunity available in, in, the hemp, in the hemp and cannabis industry is the textiles, the clothing, the plastics, the all of the other things that are available. And going back to remediation, I want to make sure everybody hears this loud and clear. It cleans our soil, right? It cleans all of this stuff that has half-lives of 10,000 years from pesticides and poisons. And we're able to pull that right back out and clean, clean our soil, right? And so when we go back to it really is, um, what was Thomas Jefferson's quote in your book, that it's the history or the lifeline basically of our valuable crop that we can grow because Absolutely. They, they knew it. They, they've they known it for 10,000 years that it's the most valuable crop. That's why it has existed on the planet for, you know, millions of years, just like other plants, just like a tomato. And, right. you know, it's kind of like making tomato plants illegal. It makes no sense other than financial interests. So again, we, when you're talking about, being passionate about this um people have their minds set people absolutely people, people go to jail you know and again you know i'll be wearing a, this is made out of hemp and i'll be wearing something man well, can you smoke that it, like if you lick it like <laughs> like people you know it, it's ludicrous and again that's why i write children's book because we have to go back to basic information this is not so that complicated. It it really right. isn't. We we have to re-educate ourselves. This isn't a new thing. This is there's so much information on this. And now that hemp is in the farm bill, we have to work on not just rescheduling it, because reschedule means going from schedule one to schedule two or three, which means then it can be studied. Okay. So we need to have it descheduled completely because if it goes to schedule two, it's just going to go directly to big pharma, whether it's hemp, whether it's, whether it's cannabis, it's going to go to big pharma. So we need to make sure it's able to be studied. We need to make sure that, that we are working within the jurisdictions, because again, I have to go back to standards. We, we should have an international standard that covers this plant whether it is in Mexico, in Canada, in Thailand, in Europe, in Asia, wherever it is, all of that should be the exact same because the, the level of THC should be the same for hemp or cannabis in well, international standards as well as the growing requirements because when you have a regulated market, you have taxes and these taxes are paid to the u.s government which means the u.s government should be supporting the growing of the agriculture and so again as we move this through different channels within our systems um it's going to take a re-education campaign also from the u.s government because we are surrounded by weed now canada's legal fully Mexico's legal fully. They have the ability now to import and export, which means, guess what? The United States, from a monetary perspective, is going to be left behind. If we cannot export our hemp or our cannabis or whatever to other countries, we are, we are putting ourselves at a disadvantage. So again, we gotta go back to banking. You guys are gonna talk about that this afternoon. All of these small farmers, all of these small businesses, why are they not able to get loans to support their businesses? Why are they not able to put their, their if they're selling dog treats or hemp tea and their bank accounts are being shut down on a monthly basis? It is, it is such a prohibitive way to do business. And so again, we, we have to re-educate people, including the financial system, including the, Certainly. you know, the, the, all the different law enforcement, all the different legislative arms. They know how valuable this is. They do. They just, 
haven't figured out how to monetize it. So again, legalize it, deschedule it, and tax it like a regular product. Yeah. And and don't throw farmers in jail for for producing a plant that could be so beneficial to so many people. So that's the stigma. So we have to destigmatize it. We have to normalize the conversation. And now so, we are I feel like a lot of this stigma, Ryan and John, and and I know you being from Utah, but um, here specifically comes with what we consume, right? Everybody assumes that that's what we talk about when we say hemp or cannabis. It's what we're consuming, smoking, CBD, CBG, CBN, putting on our bodies, right? I feel like it's important. And I loved your book, uh, Hannah Hemp, because it, it helps bridge that gap about what's available. You touch on so many subjects from um, the difference, like you showed, of, of the different types or different I, I had no idea that hops were part of the cannabis family, right? Um, so yeah, even breaking down that, wait, hops is something that everybody uses and there's not a stigma around it at all when it comes to how it's processed, right? Or or who's using it and what's happening. Same with the way that it's it's being grown, right? When we were talking earlier about industrial hemp and, and if it's something that anybody can do uh, or use, I'm so interested in, those that are growing it, where are they sending it? Is it all in-house being processed? Are they sending it out to be processed? Are they using flour? Is it um, turning into an ingredient? Ingredient. Um, I want to know, where is this going here in Utah? So I'd love to talk a little bit more about that or really figure some of that out. And I know that, Chris, you've got tons of resources too. Um, sure, I'm happy to send. I, I have studies. I have yeah. a, portion of a list of products that can be used. Um, you know, from the hemp plant, um, you know, again, it is such an ideal carbon sequestering plant. Uh, we should be talking about the benefits. Our government yes. is printing brochures on, you know, this is a miracle plant. We can't believe it. <laughs> we can't believe it. So with that, how, 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 how do we use the book and how do we use these types of resources in print that are written for at the basic level to how do we get that out to our our school districts i'm passionate i want it in our schools right we talk a lot about if it's federally backed there's a lot of of red tape or stigma around them allowing books like this potentially into the school district um, because it may affect their funding right um where do you see the best available avenue to get education out at the basic level of kids especially where there is such a wall uh, or stigma about intention or um misuse of the plant or it being illegal and a sin um whatever stigma is put around it what are your thoughts so education education is basic and the the reason i chose children's books was because that is our future. The, the people that, you don't have to convince people that work in the cannabis or hemp industries that this is a miracle plant. And most farmers are astute enough to realize as far as growing that it's, you know, a, a great easy crop to grow. It's just the supply chain and the legal issues that are holding them back. So as far as talking to children, you can teach a child not to touch a hot stove, not to talk to strangers, don't cross the street. When you're dealing with products, you have to educate the parents too. So say, you know, because we're, we're, we're adult use here in Colorado, you can, you know, buy edibles, you can buy flour, you can go to a dispensary, whether it's medical or recreational. And so we have a responsibility as parents. If we're bringing these products into our home, it's just like anything else. First of all, don't leave a cookie that looks like a cookie or gummy bears that look like gummy bears, whether they're CBD, whether they are contain THC or not, you don't leave them on the counter. You don't, you put them somewhere just like you would a, a glass of vodka or a loaded gun. You put that away yeah. from your children. We are responsible for protecting our own children. And we are also responsible for educating our children. Like you said, Mandy, beer. Today is Cinco de Mayo. Happy Cinco de Mayo, everybody. Yes. Uh, people when you're drinking beer, guess what? Beer is made out of hops. Hops is a cannabis plant. 
but yet you can drink beer or you can have a Bloody Mary or a mimosa in front of your child at a Saturday, you know, brunch. You can celebrate and toast with this. And, but also I have to, I have to tell you a story about children because I have two children. Um, my son is 27, my daughter's 22. So they grew up with me as a um, cannabis enthusiast. I love the plant and I have, um, I raised them very openly and said, you know, you're going to get a lot of peer pressure. You're going to, um, you know, try a lot of things. But I said, the only thing really that I would, you know, anything that's pharmaceutical, alcohol, tobacco, any of those things can kill you, <laughs> you know? So, but cannabis will never kill you. Cannabis will never kill you. And so, I had an experience. I was out in California at a conference and I took both of my kids with me because I was getting an award and I was, it's legal in California. And my son pointed out something to me. He said, he looked at me because I was going to light up uh, a joint. And he said, mom, he said, you didn't even ask me. <laughs> I said, I didn't realize I needed your permission. I'm over 21. He said, he said, that's the, he said, but you don't understand. He said, that's the only thing it affects other people with you smoking it. And I had never thought about that because when you're drinking, it's going into your body. When you're taking a pill, it's going into your body. You're shooting a needle into your arm. It's going into your body. So I never had thought about it, that it would affect other people. And I raised two non-cannabis smokers, which I, I don't know how I did that, but um, I believe that if you tell kids that they can do something, they're not going to do it. <laughs> if you tell kids that they can't do something, they're going to do it. You go out and do it. <laughs> and so, so again, I, I was not worried about my children when they went off to college. I knew a lot of people who, you know, don't do this, don't do that, you know, can't have a sip of this, can't, don't try anything. Then they go off to college. They do 21 shots at 21, or they take a handful of pills because we are a, a pill popping society. We, you know, our children are a little hyperactive when they're younger. Oh, let's, you know, give them some Ritalin or Adderall. My kids went to college and they said that most of their peers studied on Ritalin or Adderall for their tests. And- wow. How how are we as a society okay with feeding our overactive children that are fidgety in a classroom pills from the time they're small? And then they think that they can just grab, they have things called farm parties, P-H-A-R-M, go to your parents' medicine cabinet. Any medicine cabinet pretty much in this country has leftover Percocet, Vicodin, Demerol, all of those things heart medicine, diabetes medicine. They dump them in a bowl and then they'll just grab a handful and take it because it's okay to feed your child a pill. It's okay for mom to be on Prozac. It's okay. And I'm not saying that pharmaceuticals are bad. Pharmaceuticals are a necessity for very many people. But especially during this time where we're all in lockdown, where we have incredible financial, mental stress, we need to have a better coping mechanism to give our children than pills. And so they can also be taught that hemp and cannabis is not something that's ever going to kill you. And so then we bring it up to the next level. We bring it up to colleges and universities. They have agricultural programs. So I have a very good friend who is a genetics specialist in cannabis. Her name is Dr. Daniela Varaga. She works up at CU. She studies the genome of the cannabis plant, both hemp and, and, and cannabis. And so she is not allowed to study the plant material on the CU campus because school campuses are funded federally. And so they are not allowed to have this on campus. So how are we going to make any strides in our education? And how are we going to get this to the next level where it's studied on a, not on a schedule one basis, but where we can study it for its medicinal values, where we can study it for the strength in the building walls, 
um, where we can actually give kids degrees in this. So if you're going to agricultural college and you're learning, you know, how to take care of animals, how to take care of crops, how to do all the agricultural things that you need to do in order to have a working, you know, sustainable farm or ranch, you need to add the agriculture of hemp or cannabis into those degrees. Because again, that's the future generations are going to shape this planet. And while we may be getting late to the party, we still can educate future generations about this amazing plan and its possibilities for taking it into the future. In you know, they can get a degree in in botany on how to grow this stuff. They can get a degree in, you know, building, you know, with hemp products. I would love to see skyscrapers built out of hemp. And if you look at the viability and the, the longevity of the hemp itself, there are buildings all over the world and monuments and caves and 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 beautiful things that have been built in hemp that are still in existence today. They're mold proof, they're fireproof, they're earthquake proof, they're bug proof. So we are living in our hermetically sealed houses with toxic chemicals all around us. We're taking pharmaceuticals on a daily basis. We are destroying our immune systems, which is right now something that we need very much to, to fight off the coronavirus or any virus or bacteria. We need to be able to go back to our roots with not wearing toxic things that are made out of polyester and plastics and, and, and coming from you know sweatshops. We need to be able to eat foods, including hemp. You can take from the hemp plant the weeds and put those in the juice in your kids' shakes in the morning. It's not going to get them high. They're, they're not going to be tested at school for having THC in their bodies. They're not going to act strange. But what do you think the number one sport in school, in high school and college, or traumatic brain injuries. What do you think is the number one sport? Football. Soccer. Football. Nope. Nope. It is cheerleading. So Ooh. what happens is these girls practicing cheerleading, if you were giving them, this is a neuroprotectant and anti-inflammatory, if you're putting leaves in their shakes in the morning, it can have those neuroprotectant properties. So if she happens to get dropped on her head through a throw or a fall, that that it's not going to cause her, you know, scarring on her brain later in life. Football players, you see all these sporting organizations that are finally allowing their athletes, you know, this is an anti-inflammatory. This can be used topically. This can be used for pain. This can be used for mental health. This can be used for food. So again, we can't we can't change people's mind. And unfortunately, it seems that the only time people change their minds, we, we as humans don't learn from a place of pleasure. We learn from a place of pain. So when you see a person who has been anti-drug their entire life and the Just Say No, Nancy Reagan campaign and D.A.R.E. programs. I went through all those. And unfortunately, I alcoholism runs in my family. But that is not something that I wanted to, to pursue. So cannabis is a subst substance that works for me. And I use it internally. I use it externally. I wear clothing out of it. I have hempcrete structures in my backyard. I educate about it. But until we can get back to that normalization, we're going to have people that are going to jail for it. We're going to have people that are incarcerated and locked up for even hemp. So, so the ramifications of keeping this substance illegal, not only the banking, not only the fact that we don't have ways to process it, not only the fact that, that if we educate at the most basic level our children, who will then grow up and hopefully go to a college or university that teaches this as a subject and then move it into corporate America where the packaging, the labeling, the boxes, the ink, the, the supply chain is there. It's, it's 
a cheap enough product that people aren't going to buy something plastic from a foreign country. They're going to be buying American. They're going to be buying something that's healthy for them. They're going to be feeding their families with this amazing plant. They're going to be going right back to their roots. And yes, even if you're growing one or two plants, we should have every elder in this country should be having a cannabis plant inside because first of all, they don't need to worry about it. They could be juicing the leaves. They could be using that plant for themselves. So you can buy hemp seeds in Costco. It, you can buy Evo hemp bars. No, they're not going to get you high. They're going to help support your immune system. They're going to help support your brain function. They're going to help support your digestive system. They're going to help support all these things that are so crucial for human health and animal health. Look at the, the huge pet products industry. You know, the billions of dollars that people spend on their pets. They, they are, it's equal to what we spend on our children. So when we're thinking about future opportunities, the opportunities for this plant are endless. We just have to make sure that we are educating people from the get-go, whether it's children, whether it's universities, whether it's high schools, but we've tried to get our book. We've, we had our book inducted into the library in Pueblo um, back in 2014, Cali Cannabis. Um, they have an entire section on, on cannabis and, and all parts, marijuana, hemp, um, but you wouldn't believe how difficult it is to get into the school systems. It's incredibly hard. We've, we've, we've inducted it into, we've, we've sent it to almost every school district here in Colorado. And unfortunately they're not ready for the message. And okay. So for kids at home. Okay. So I, what I, I love your passion and I want to keep, keep talking. Unfortunately, <laughs> we're almost out of time, but I want to, I want to, I want to work on this and I want this to be an opportunity for us as a team to continue to get education and information out that's live. Like it or not, it's easier to find stuff face to face and video content works online. People are watching it. It's easier to, to tag. There is a ton of information in this video, even alone. But some things that I really want to focus on are our hemp history or um, hemp hemp opportunities equally as much as the history and what has happened. There's a ton of resources, all these things Chris has talked about, people are doing. It's not, it's not that people are not printing on hemp paper, it's that it's not as common as we'd like to see, right? And so being able to make it a common practice um, because the resources are so readily available through this plant. But also I wanna focus on, you know, I'd love to come back and talk about the testing. I'd love to come back and talk about your events and what you have going. I'd love to attend some of your events and I wanna know how, how do I get in touch or how do people get in touch you know, if they want to learn more about the, the opportunity. I think the culture we talk about a lot on this show that people want to talk face to face, not just online. And so we love this platform to get this information out and be able to educate and use it as a tool, not just with the book. The book I love because it is so, it is not abrasive at all. It's very elementary when it comes to um, like it is not scary. It is not, it does not push anything on you. It's very fact and I love it. Um, but also I want really bad. You had mentioned some friends. I want to talk cooking with cannabis about the benefits. And so I hadn't even thought about using the hemp plant and smoothies and some of those benefits. And so I'd love, I know you've got a close friend or somebody I'd love to highlight them. Um, and then also coming up, talking more about some of the associations and boards that you sit on at some point, because I think that you have a lot of wealth or resources that we can link or use. And so maybe in the future coming back and maybe breaking up and doing one section at a time where we can do some specific questions or Q and A's, if that's something you're interested in or maybe connecting with me. Yeah, no, I, I, and I, you know, obviously I'm passionate about this plant, but I'm passionate sure. about the, I am very blessed. I live in Colorado. I'm not going to go to jail for this plant. You know, I, 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 I feel I have such a good opportunity to share education with people from a basic perspective. This isn't to change people's minds. It's not, if, if you're not interested in cannabis or hemp, then don't use it, but don't take this opportunity away from the world, is what I'm saying. And I would love to give you my resources. We have 
Cooking with the Hemp Lady. We have Urban Kitchen and Revolution in the Kitchen that um, can teach you hemp recipes. We have, um, you know, Derek, uh, Derek Cross has a great, the Hemp Chat. You have all kinds of different organizations that I think all of your members should start looking at these. There's U.S. Hemp Building Association. There's the Chris. Would you National would you Hemp mind Hemp. would you mind recording a session with me and we can kind of talk about some of these specific topics online and maybe we can take clips of them and share them so that you know as people have questions and I'm going to send out a survey or we as a team are sending a survey out to all of our members here pretty soon. Let us know some of these topics and information that you're looking for or wanting and so we can specifically address them with Chris or any of our other professionals that we have on. And again, if you haven't followed or liked our our Facebook page, follow us today, join us, share. Um, we've got some other great topics later this afternoon. We are going to be discussing COAs and going to be putting that live so we can talk about some of the labs and, and what people are looking for, why they should be having certain things tested and so forth, going back to what we talked about with remediation of the soil and so forth. Ryan and John, do you have anything else? I know we're out of time, but anything else before we log off? Yeah, no, just, um, yeah, I was just going to say real quick, thank you, Chris, for coming on today. That was my that was so much good information. I mean, I just couldn't stop taking notes and on everything you were saying. It was amazing today. But uh, for everybody listening, again, callieandfriends.com. Go to her website, pick up a book. I actually, while we were on the show, I've ordered my book. I'm excited. It's on its way. So I'm excited oh, to get yeah. it so I can share it with my kids as well because I think this is really important. So I'm Thank super you. excited. Chris, that, but everybody, all these get better a go book. behind my order. They all better look behind mine. No way. <laughs> no, thank you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you you talking to me. And I'm happy, you know, I'm happy to share this information. This is not proprietary information. This is information that everybody needs to know. We all need to be connected. We all need to work on this together because this is how we will save the world. This really is a, a miracle product, a miracle plant. It is a beautiful thing to be back in an era where we can utilize this plant to its fullest extent and that our children can benefit from cleaner air and cleaner water and cleaner soil and better health. I mean, that, that's what we all desire in our world. And so I am more than happy to share my information and I would love to come back on and talk anytime. And hopefully um, I will uh, send you um, I'm shooting a video of what we do here. We do a little permaculture. We do education here at the the ozone, and I'm more than happy to to give you a video tour that you can send out to your people. Um, and you know, just seeing how we can educate future generations is totally my my jam. So I'm happy I've to got, anytime. I've got a better idea. Right before we sign off, I'll come to your space right. and we'll do a video and no. share it. I'm well, sorry to anyone else, but. No, I just um, put in um, a recording studio here. So I have a green screen, I have microphone, I have acoustic ceiling tiles. So we're okay. scared because this is the future. We're we're not gonna probably be able to travel for as many conferences as we did. And we're gonna have to do more of the video chat. So I'm gonna have to get a little bit better on the technology. So I hired some professionals and um, next time I'll be sitting in my, uh, my studio. <laughs> Love it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank I'll be in again. touch. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. It was nice to see you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank see you. you. Have a good day. Everybody. See you all tomorrow.